Welcome to the walkthrough for Part B of Assignment 1. The objective of the second part of this assignment is to learn how to synchronize Java threads via a semaphore and a spin lock. Videos describing Java semaphores appear here and here. Likewise, a video describing spin locks appears here. I recommend you watch these videos to ensure you understand these Java synchronizers. Naturally, we'll cover these topics in class as well. In the second part of this assignment, you'll use a semaphore and a spin lock to enhance the multi-threaded implementation of the Palantiri Simulator app from Assignment 1A. Assignment 1B focuses on the Palantiri Manager, which is used to restrict the number of beings from Middle Earth who can concurrently gaze into a fixed number of Palantiri. If you're not yet a fan of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings trilogy, you should drop everything you're doing and read about Palantiri here. The Palantiri Simulator app is packaged as a project using the latest version of Android Studio. This app is written in both Kotlin and Java and demonstrates many Android capabilities. For the purposes of Assignment 1B, however, you just need to focus on the following three folders. Simulator Manager's Palantiri spin lock hash map, which contains the skeletons you need to fill in, as described below. App Source Test, which is a set of unit tests that exercise many Palantiri Simulator features and can be used to help test the functionality you implement for the assignment. And App Source Android Test, which is an Android Studio instrumentation test that runs your app automatically. To compile this code, you need to use the provided Android Studio project. You can run this project by clicking the green Run App button in the Android Studio IDE, which should automatically select an Android emulator to run, assuming you have one created. The app's minimum API is 29, so you'll need to select an emulator that uses an API greater than or equal to 29, though I recommend you use API 30. If you don't already have an emulator created, you can create it by clicking on the AVD Manager button in the Android Studio IDE. In addition to integrating the updated runnable threadsmanager.java and simple being runnable.java files from your Assignment 1A solution, you need to modify several files containing the skeleton Java code by completing the to do you fill in here tasks to provide a working solution. Do not change the overall structure of the skeleton, just fill in the to do tasks, and do not delete the to do tags. In particular, you'll need to finish implementing the following to do tasks for this assignment in the spinlock hash map folder. Spinlock hash map manager.java, where you need to complete the to-do tasks in various methods to implement a palantiri manager via a semaphore, the appropriate type of spinlock, and a hash map manager. Spinlock.java. If you're taking this class for undergraduate credit, you need to complete the to-do tasks in various methods in this file to emulate a compare and swap style spinlock with non-recursive semantics. Spinlock Dot Java, which is the reentrant one. If you're taking this class for graduate credit, you need to complete the to-do tasks in the various methods to complete a compare and swap style spin lock with recursive semantics. Student.kt. You need to complete the to-do tags here to set the type field to either graduate or undergraduate, depending on which version of the assignment that you're implementing. Your app will be considered correct if it passes all the unit and instrumentation tests and all beings successfully complete all their n iterations. A correct simulation should restrict the number of gazing beings to the number of palantiri. In other words, if there are four palantiri in the simulation, then only four beings should ever be gazing on the screen at a time. When the simulation is running, the app view will display visual feedback to show palantiri and being states, as well as the progress of their gazing iterations. If your assignment implementation is correct and doesn't throw any exceptions, the title bar for the app labels will appear green when the simulation completes. If the implementation throws an exception or is not implemented correctly, however, then red title bar labels will be displayed when the simulation completes. Skeleton code for this assignment is available from my GitHub account. Once you've set up your GitLab account, you can pull the skeleton code into your repository, read it carefully, and complete the to-do markers. The additional work required by graduate students is clearly marked. This assignment is designed to help you get familiar with writing multi-threaded programs using the Android Studio IDE and core Java synchronization mechanisms, which complement the core Java multi-threaded mechanisms we covered in Assignment 1A. It doesn't require you to program with more advanced Java synchronizers or any advanced Java and Android concurrency frameworks, which we'll cover in upcoming assignments. Now that I've given you an overview of the assignment, let's drill down on the various skeletons you'll need to implement. These skeletons all reside in the Manager's Palantiri Spinlock Hash Map folder. We'll start with the Spinlock 
hash map manager class, which everyone needs to implement. This class extends the Palantir manager and uses a spin lock, a semaphore, and a hash map in order to be able to restrict access by many being threads to a fixed number of Palantiri. You'll have to provide a field that is used to implement the spin lock. This spin lock, in turn, will be used to ensure that threads serialize on the critical sections we'll look at below. There's two different spin lock implementations. One, which is the spin lock class, which undergrads have to implement, and the other is the reentrant spin lock class, which students taking the class for grad credit have to implement. In either event, you need to define an instance of that here as a field. You'll also have to define a counting semaphore that limits the concurrent access to the fixed number of available Palantiri that are managed by the Palantir manager. I provided you an implementation of a Palantiri map, which is a hash map that associates the Palantiri key to a Boolean value that's used to keep track of whether the key is available. You'll see how that gets used in just a moment. There's a hook method called back called build model that's called by the framework. And this is used to initialize the various fields we just described. So we go ahead and make a new hash map. And then you'll have to call the get Palantiri factor method and use the result that comes back to that in order to be able to initialize the Palantiri map with the appropriate values. You'll also have to initialize the semaphore to use a fair implementation in order to mediate concurrent access to the given Palantiri. And finally, you'll have to implement the spin lock field. So those are fairly straightforward things to do, but you have to think through how to implement a fair semaphore. That's probably the thing that'll take little, little doing. Down here is the acquire method. This method is called back in order to be able to acquire a Palantir. And it's intended to block until one is available if there isn't one available right away. So the way this works under the hood is you'll use the semaphore in order to uninterruptibly acquire a, a palantir, or, or rather, let me rephrase that, in order to wait until there's a palantir available. And then you'll use the spin lock in order to ensure that only one thread at a time can actually come in and check the hash map to find the first key whose value is true. And this, of course, has to be done with the lock held so that you don't end up having race conditions when concurrent threads would update and access the hash map simultaneously. Once you found a free Palantir in the hash map, then you need to set its value to false to indicate that it is not available. And then that Palantir will be returned to the client and you'll release the spin lock. All the code I just described needs to go here. There's also a little check, sort of a sanity check at the bottom of this method that will throw an illegal state exception if something went wrong. So make sure that you return properly, and if things go awry, make sure you go down here to throw this illegal state exception. Here's the release method. The release method is, of course, the inverse of acquire. It's intended to return the Palantir back to the Palantir manager, so it's available for other beings to use. And the way this works is the Palantir is passed back in, you'll need to be able to use the spin lock in order to make sure you have exclusive access to the hash map. Go ahead and change the value in the hash map, set it to true, saying it's now available for reuse. And then you'll release the, the uh, spin lock. And then you'll also go ahead and increment the semaphore to indicate that there's now a possibility for another thread to go ahead and get access into the the Palantiri manager if, if there was a contention for the number of beings that were currently gazing with the limited number of Palantiri. So those are the methods that you have to go ahead and implement. Uh, here's a little hint. I call the field M available Palantiri. That's just the name that I used up here when I defined this. You could call it something different if you wanted to, but uh, that was what I happened to call it. So probably wouldn't be a bad idea to use the same name. It's currently colored in red because I have taken that definition out, so you'll have the, the fun of figuring out how to do the implementation yourself. Let's go take a look at the skeleton for spin lock. This is what the undergraduates have to implement. So the spin lock is used to emulate a compare and swap style spin lock 
with so-called non-recursive semantics. That means that once a thread acquires a lock, it cannot reacquire the lock unless it releases it first. The way you're going to do this is you're going to use something called an atomic boolean, and that has a method called uh, compare and, and set. And the default state of the spin lock should be unlocked. So you'll have to go ahead and define an atomic boolean with those properties set here. There's a method called try lock, which is used to do a non-blocking acquire. So you'll have to go ahead and use the atomic booleans compare and set method correctly here to do that check. The main method that you'll use is the one that's called lock. This is the one you have to implement. This is used to check to see whether or not the uh, thread, uh, sorry, whether the lock is available. And if it's unlocked, then we're going to atomically lock it and then return. If it's already locked, we're going to continually spin, waiting for another thread to release that lock. So that's where you're going to have to use the atomic Boolean uh, compare and set operation in order to do that. And there's a method, I, I, uh, there's a field rather called M owner, which is what I called the atomic Boolean. So I called it M owner for, for lock owner. And this describes how you'll need to do this. You'll need to have a loop here that keeps trying to atomically set the value to true. And you should also, at the each time you try and fail, uh, you should also check to see if a shutdown has been requested. And if it has been requested, then you want to go ahead and throw a cancellation exception. So you're going to check to see whether uh, cancellation has been uh, requested. And if so, it'll shut it down. Unlock will simply atomically set the Boolean to be uh, false. In other words, it's now available for use. So you'll have to do a, an atomic operation. Of course, everything on the atomic Boolean is atomic, but you'll have to call the appropriate method to set the value of the lock to be uh, false, which means it will be released. So we'll talk about how spin locks work in class, but these are basically the things you'll have to implement in order to make this work properly. Let's take a look at what the grad students have to do. The grad students have to implement a spin lock that has so-called recursive semantics, which we call reentrant. So a reentrant spin lock is like a spin lock, but it has this reentrant property. And all that means is that if a thread currently owns the lock, then it can reacquire the lock, simply incrementing a recursion count without having to release it first. So it makes it recursive. So basically, what you're going to have to do here is define an atomic reference that's used as the basis for the atomic compare and swap. And the default state of the spin lock, of course, should be unlocked. Now, the way you're going to do this is we're going to actually keep track of the thread ID that's the current owner of the lock. And so you'll have an atomic reference that's parameterized by thread. You'll also have to define a field that will count the number of times the owner thread has recursively acquired the lock. And so it just has to be a simple count, nothing fancy here. You can use an int, for example, as long as you give it the right default value. Over here, you have to implement the try lock method. This is the one that's used for non-blocking acquisition of the lock. And what you'll have to do there is fill in the value to basically try to set the owner's value, which this is the owner of the, the reference, to the value of the thread, which is considered true. And this will succeed if and only if the current value is null, which indicates false. So that's just sort of a one-liner. Down here is really the workhorse method. This is the lock method. Similar to the one that the undergrads have to implement, the main difference here is that you'll have to get the current thread and then you'll use the thread reference in order to be able to try to set the value of the atomic reference to the current thread reference. And that thread reference, of course, will be non-null. And so you'll have to keep checking to see whether or not you can atomically do compare and set to set the value of the atomic reference to the thread reference and then check to see whether it's null. So you'll have to figure out how to do that. Uh, once again, you'll have to check each time you fail to do the set atomically, when you fail to get the, the exclusive access, to check to see if you've been canceled or not. And then if you haven't canceled, you have to throw a uh, cancellation exception. Unlock simply goes ahead and sets the, the value back to null, the value, the, the, the value of M owner, which is the atomic reference, back to null but only if the recursion count is 
going to be equal to zero. If the recursion count is greater than zero and the calling thread, the thread that calls on lock is the one that currently owns the lock, then simply the recursion count is decremented by one. So only when the count is zero and the calling thread is the thread that owns the lock will we atomically release the lock that's currently held by the owner. So those are the various classes you'll have to implement in order to be able to do this part of the assignment. The key thing you'll be learning here again are semaphores in order to be able to mediate access to shared resources concurrently, as well as spin locks, which are used to guard critical sections from simultaneous access in order to be able to prevent race conditions. Now that we've walked through the specifications and the skeletons, it's time to turn our attention to the unit tests. If you go to the Android Studio project and click on App Source Test, and then right click on Java, you can select the menu item Run Tests in Java. And that will cause Android Studio to go ahead and build and run the various unit tests that we've configured for Assignment 1B, which also, of course, includes all the unit tests that we had for Assignment 1A. As you can see here, there are 37 tests. My implementation, no surprise, passes all the tests. If all the tests pass, you see the green check marks. If something goes wrong, you'll get some indications that'll either be orange or red. If that happens, then please go ahead and take a careful look at what's happening and see what you can do to fix the problems. Naturally, if you have any problems whatsoever that you don't know how to fix yourself, feel free to come to office hours and or post questions on Piazza. As the projects go along throughout the semester, as we have more assignments, you'll have to continue to pass all the previous unit tests. And that's important because we'll often add new tests over time as we get better insights into how to automatically check to see whether or not the implementations that you're providing actually implement the specifications correctly. Now that we've run the unit tests, it's time to show you how to run the instrumentation tests. We'll click down here and go ahead and say, run the instrumentation tests. As you can see, everything starts up, things are being loaded. And over here, we can see the Android emulator. Let's go ahead and uh, do a couple things. Let me show you the Android emulator here. It should start running. As you can see, it's basically doing a torture test of your application, rotating the screen, having many different beings gaze on a smaller number of Palantiri. In this case, we have 10 beings that are gazing at six Palantiri for 10 iterations each. You can see it keeps track of the number of iterations. If it works successfully, everything should be green. If for some reason you have some kind of a bug in your code, then you'll see red show up there. Uh, and this will keep running uh, on and on. Uh, if you take a look over here and go to Logcat, you can actually see what's happening as things are running. Um, we'll have to wait till it starts running again. There we go, it's tearing it down, bring it back up again. Gonna go ahead and do some more torture tests here momentarily. Unit tests are really good to exercise and evaluate the performance of individual components. But of course, what really matters when all is said and done is how the app works. So you can see here that this is printing information out as things are running. If something goes wrong and your program crashes, I recommend you take a look at Logcat. It will most likely tell you what is going wrong with your code. Uh, going back over here, you can see that this thing keeps doing the torture test over and over again. Uh, and it's just a really nice, easy way to get a feeling for whether or not your app is working properly or not. So I strongly recommend that you use the instrumentation tests in order to be able to evaluate whether your app is actually running. This will keep running for a while. Uh, of course, it's all gonna work properly because I wrote the code correctly, but uh, you should get in the habit of running these tests, taking a look at the output from Logcat and uh, making sure that everything is green when it actually performs.